Let's see. Uh, next question is from Zach on energy balance. Uh, Gary Tobbs versus Chris Kresser. Hey, Rob, long time follow and really appreciate the work you're doing. I wish I had known about keto and paleo when I was younger. I feel my athletic performance could have propelled me to the next level. Either way, I'm happy to have it in my life today as it keeps me thin and healthy. Your keto masterclass has been instrumental in guiding me through my keto paleo journey. So thank you. I've been very interested in the low carb diet for 10 plus years now, and it started with Gary Tobbs. Gary Tobbs is famous for saying that calories don't count, and in my anecdotal experience, they don't. I must stress that since it works for me, I'm completely happy with the results. However, when trying to speak intelligently about keto and low carb, I'm trying to get bridge a gap from Gary to Chris Kresser's podcast with Joe Rogan last week. On Joe Rogan, Chris said that you must run a caloric deficit to lose weight. Now I'm really confused. I'm an engineer and have taken several thermodynamics courses, so from an energy balance equation, I understand that the human body cannot defy thermodynamic pr principles, but obviously our metabolism is much more complex than an energy in, energy out black box. Furthermore, energy in, energy out does not feel right for a number of reasons, such as, for instance, energy expended drinking cold water is not in this equation. That is your body warming the cold water up. Energy that is never consumed, but rather part of a defecation event, etc. I have eaten uh, what I perceive to be a major energy surplus on a ketogenic diet and have still lost weight. My caveat there is that I wasn't weighing food, so I cannot really know. My apologies if you've already answered this question, but I could not find it on your blog or searching your website. I'm hoping you can point me to a study, a white paper, or a text, or some reliable information that will answer the question of who's right. Gary Tobbs or Chris Kresser? Thanks, Rob. You're a legend. Man, um, so when, my initial foray into the whole low carb scene was uh, it, it, it was just prior to Gary's first uh, really popular paper, the Soft Science of Dietary Fat, and and, and um, a couple of other papers. But this was around two thousand one that Gary's first paper came out, and it was really kind of this. Uh, it was pretty powerful because. It, it received a lot of attention, a lot of bandwidth, and it was validating for kind of the the very nascent and early low carb paleo kind of, kind of ancestral health scene. There was nobody out there fighting for this or advocating for it, or it, like it was really kind of like the dark ages of of kind of putting these ideas forward. And Gary's work was really kind of a beacon of hope. And I've got to say that for me. Having been on a carbohydrate roller coaster my whole life prior to this, and I, I was kind of lean, but not really lean. And then when I when I went low carb, I I would just like pour olive oil on my food and eat it, and I I was like Skeletor lean, and I was also younger, and I was much more active, and you know like there were all these other factors, but I could eat with pretty much reckless abandon and be as lean as I wanted to be. And I had rock solid energy levels, and I, I, I think that that is a not uncommon experience for many people. And this is part of why Gary's idea that he threw out there that it's not really the calories, it's just the insulin, had some stickiness because on at a macro level, there were a lot of people that that their personal experience kind of matched up with that. And then even working with clients, we had clients that. We just changed the qualitative nature of their food and they were still eating like a Costco container of like almonds or cashews or whatever as part of their overall eating strategy. And they were still losing weight relative to what they were doing before. Um, to Zach's point, um, they still may have been introducing some degree of a caloric deficit in this whole thing. Um, at the end of the day, there's a huge variation. And, and Zach, you touched on some of these things like... Some people absorb more calories out of their diet than other folks do. Like just tweaks in the gut microbiome can make people 10, 20% more efficient at harvesting calories out of the food that would otherwise just pass through. Um, people with celiac disease, and this is where the gut microbiome gets really interesting. They're always like diversity, diversity, diversity. But folks with celiac, celiac disease tend to have a more diverse gut microbiome. And the thought there is that it's kind of a, a response to the fact that the person is likely suffering nutrient deficiencies because of the gut damage. And so they're trying to prop up the microbial diversity so that there's more opportunity to actually harvest nutrients into the gut. It's kind of, you know, entirely speculative. There's not a randomized control trial on this. So clearly like the you know, the Nortons and Aragons of the world are going to like take a, a shit down the back of the whole notion. But um, it, it's uh, uh, 
it's really interesting and there's a remarkable spread and variation on that side. There's a pretty good spread on just even the way that people um, manifest, you know, calories at the mitochondrial level. Like I've talked about that in my metabolic flexibility talk where some people are really kind of jammed up in that uh, uh, kind of carb dependent mitochondrial complex. And those people, um, they, they, they kind of burn more energy inefficiently. They're producing a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species, but it's a more caloric intensive process. It's not necessarily good though. It's like, oh, I get to eat more food. And it's like, yeah, and you're aging and oxidizing yourself at a, a faster rate. This is part of the benefit of being metabolically flexible and tending towards fat mobilization and fat utilization as kind of a primary fuel source. You tend, going through that mitochondrial complex too, you tend to produce fewer reactive oxygen species, which is arguably more thermodynamically efficient. But at the end of the day, it's still all, the thermodynamics are legit, but what, what gets lost in this story is one person's thyroid profile is X, another person's is Y. And depending on the delta between those, one may be far more efficient with calories than the other one. And there's pluses and minuses to both of those stories. So uh, what's unfortunate, in my opinion, with Gary, I, I really like the guy, I consider him a friend, but he got wrapped around the axle of proving the insulin hypothesis instead of having that be a potentiality, but he really linked his whole wagon in existence to proving that versus I suggested ages ago, 10 years ago, when Nusi was just kind of in its infancy, let's focus on the outcomes and the fact that low carb diets really benefit people. And let's focus on the outcome driven element instead of being so wed to proving the mechanistic side. Now, I understand the, the impetus there. Um, if you, in theory, if you can prove mechanism of causation, then, you know, we have in theory better control of what's going on, but this is just a nearly infinite process. Like at, at, at the end of the day, there's huge spectrums and variation. I was on a podcast yesterday where I was talking about this stuff and just thinking about like caffeine metabolism, there are some people that if you give them a hundred milligrams of, of caffeine, in four hours, they have metabolized half of it. So the, the, the half-life, Luis, for example. There are other people that the half-life for caffeine for them is 30 hours. Mm. So we've got nearly a 10x spread on just the ability to metabolize a, a, a common you know, feature of, of our existence, you know, caffeine. And so you have nearly a 10x spread, and I don't think that there's remotely that big of a spread with regards to like the way that calories impact people. But what if it's a 2x spread or a point or a 25% spread? That ends up manifesting hugely over the course of like a 2000 calorie diet, you know? I mean, it, it could be the, you know, 400 calories plus or minus one, one way or the other. And I, I don't know what the real story is there, but we, we do know that there's massive variation from person to person. And, um, uh, what is the guy's name? The the great Randy or whatever. Like the, there's this guy that's had like a million dollar offer for people to prove um, psychic abilities and paranormal stuff. And it's been since like the, the mid eighties and nobody's been able to do it. Like so far paranormal shit doesn't seem to exist. Um, everybody has failed to produce it. And so this, this notion that somehow there's a workaround thermodynamics in the body is kind of ridiculous on the one hand, or maybe not ridiculous, but it's not, the, it, 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 it's not being supported over the, the course of time. But then the thing that I think that the it fits your macros and the evidence-based nutrition folks kind of miss is that the, the complexity of that thermodynamic story is jaw-droppingly complex. And it, it, it the um, the fact that people overeat due to complex food combinations and hyperpalatable foods and stress and like all this other stuff kind of gets dismissed and and it, it's not really woven into a, a holistic approach to helping people manifest change. So I know that was all over the place, Zach. It, it's just it, it's a really interesting big topic, but I, I would have to say that. Um, this is a situation in which Gary, in my opinion, got fooled mm -hmm. by an 
observational element, which is that there are some people that just seem able to eat a ridiculous amount of calories on a low carb or ketogenic diet and either maintain weight or, or lose weight. But at the end of the day, uh, Presser is a bit more on point with this stuff and that you've got to uh, uh, introduce some sort of a caloric deficit to really And we see this on out. keto all the time because people will be like, oh, just eat all the fat and you'll lose weight. And for some people it works and for other people they gain weight on keto. So. And what we find with that is that the, the folks that are focusing on fat are under eating protein. And because of the protein leverage hypothesis, we have a decent understanding that if we under eat protein, we will be goosed to eat more of whatever is out there mm. in an attempt to get appropriate nutrition. And that could be higher carb or, or lower carb, but there's kind of a reality that if we hit that appropriate protein threshold, then people tend to spontaneously reduce caloric intake. Okay. And that's all I've got to say on that. <laughs> <laughs>